This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so this is The Influence of Architecture in Cold War Literature, which is a paper that has basically been born out of my thesis. Uh, it's, I suppose it's a, it's a summary, if we can call it that. Um, so there exists a fast dualism of values in the literature and culture of America during the Cold War. By Cold War, I refer to the post-war era, specifically 1945 to 1965. Whilst highly aware of the ongoing nature of the Cold War and the pervasiveness of its presence throughout much of the latter part of the 20th century, my paper concentrates on the America of the 50s, so highly emblematic of Americanism and frequently considered with nostalgia, a time which promotes suburbia, housewives, child-centric living, Hollywood, togetherness, Tupperware and television. It is a time of great political and social conservatism, moral familial values, wholesomeness, and yet, in both the culture and literature produced at the time, we find marginality, transgression, and an escape from this typecast America. The culture of post-war America seems so highly paradoxical, being at once conformist and transgressive, where television parodies normalcy in I Love Lucy, and film encourages insurgency in Rebel Without a Cause. Architecture provides transparent surfaces to bring the outside in, yet divisions between inside and outside are upheld for protection. Good housekeeping prescribes domestic divinity, whilst Playboy threatens masculine debauchery. With a culture based upon such multiplicities and without a univocal identity, how can the self be grounded formed or situated. Without concrete assertions of what it is to ascribe to normalcy, authenticity, conformity, us, how can identity and selfhood be produced at this time? My interest is the manner in which Cold War America called for containment, homogeneity and semblance of identity through spaces, developments, architecture, sites and literary and visual, visual ephemera where a unified identity, and more importantly, a clear understanding of what it was to be one of us, was the basis for being American, authentic, and normal. Cold War culture, in the words of Alan Nadel, is one characterised by containment. A containment of gendered identities, a containment of sexuality, a containment of communist politics, and a containment of public and private spheres, as separate and distinct from one another. In terms of identity, this culture created static yet paradoxical gender roles, domestic masculinity versus commercial individualism, conformist femininity versus public autonomy, and in doing so prescribed a performativity, identity that was worn and acted out on the body. In short, containment culture highlighted the oppositional ideals at the heart of post-war America, where a duality and multiplicity of ideals and cultural values were accepted as the norm. If the ideology of the Cold War called for an acceptable performance of the self to be worn, the emphasis of selfhood lies only on the surface of the body, and this opens up the possibility for an unknown interior, essentially undermining the very notion of what it means to be real and instead to be able to know them from us. Consider Nicholas Ray's film, Rebel Without a Cause. Here the home is quite clearly the inscriber of domesticated identity. The parental influence is so firmly fixed within the home that Jim's parents are never shown outside its boundaries. Despite Jim's departure on three occasions in a delinquent rage, they stand and watch from the safety of the domestic environment, and their urgency and protestations cease once Jim is beyond the door both parents observing, rather than actively preventing, chasing or following Jim. With such strong domestic identities as role models, Jim's masculinity is threatened, and it is for this reason that we see him begin his search for another, more rebellious version of himself. One way in which Jim attempts to find an alternative is through clothing, a trying on of different identities. At the start of the film, Jim's appearance is marked by its conformity and domesticated manhood, 
as implied by the soft tweed and flannel clothing, worn in contrast to the hard denim and leather of Buzz and his gang. Yet, once Jim decides to defend his masculinity, emerging from childhood into adulthood by accepting the chicky run in defiance of his domesticated father, he resorts to wearing a red jacket, thereby suggesting the putting on of a suitably violent and aggressive masculinity, wearing a rebellious masculine mask. This rebellious masquerade seems faintly eroticised, signalled by the wearing of red, and the eroticising of subjectivity draws a distinct differentiation between the drabness of his father's impotence and normative manhood, and the possibility of a glamorised struggle for anti-suburban sexuality. These worn identities conflate the idea of performativity, masking an identity with conformity, illustrating the possibility of remoulding, refitting, and re-territorialising the self in order to find a suitable subjectivity. Clearly, there are aspects of Ray's choice of setting for his film that dictate the performance of identity for his characters. Jim's parents do not exercise their parental, dis parental discipline on their son beyond the home, and Jim's victorious moment of masculine heroism takes place many miles from his front door. Spaces, it seems, are therefore capable of marking and moulding the bodies of the Cold War. With both Judith Butler and Elizabeth Grosch assert the importance of wearing external identities, where genders produce the effect of substance and produce signifiers of bodily gender. Essentially, gender under these terms becomes something which is constructed, manufactured and fabricated to an extent that acts and gestures, articulated and enacted desires create the illusion of an interior and organising gender core. Genders can be neither true nor false, neither real nor apparent, neither original nor derived. Worryingly then, this calls into question the person behind the performance and for an incoherent norm of cultural intelligibility. There is no gender identity behind the expressions of gender. That identity is performatively constituted by the very expressions that are said to be its results. Hence, the ideology of the Cold War was built upon a convention which actively denied the autonomous or real selves. By emphasising the exterior, bodies are confined to surface, where subjectivity becomes inscribed, marked and engraved by social pressures, as well as by the built space which bodies inhabit, encouraging these bodies to interact and react to these spatial surroundings, mirroring, absorbing and reflecting aspects of the spatial environment. For instance, at the most basic level, suburban architecture inscribes female bodies with domestic identity, whilst office buildings mark masculine selves with performatively uh, individualistic selves. The bodies of the Cold War are therefore performatively inscribed by their location, and with this knowledge we can assert that bodies react to the surfaces of their built and bounded environment. Consider Jack Kerouac's On the Road where space functions as a facilitator of masculine identity. Here the constant movement between suburban spaces and the non-bounded space of the road directly reflect onto Sal Paradise's characterization, reshaping him into a new version of himself with every new dis newly discovered locale. The car and road itself are crucial to Kerouac's creation of a newly defined masculinity implying by its very being the movement away from the known and the movement towards something new. Somewhere along the line I knew there'd be girls, visions, everything. Somewhere along the line the pearl would be handed to me. These unbounded male bodies are able to express a new form of masculinity precisely as they are effectively homeless. Quite literally removed from the inscriptive surfaces of bounded space, instead allowing the road and highways of America to both distance and abolish the continent, decentralising social spaces and individualising subjectivities. But no matter, the road is life. The road is uncomplicated, desexualized, and therefore the car and the road become erasers and healers of old subjectivities, wiping the memory and even reality of the past self, where the emphasis is no longer on emotion but rather simply being, a defining of oneself. Bitterness, recriminations, advice, morality, sadness, 
everything was behind him, and ahead of him was the ragged and ecstatic joy of pure being. Through a creation of individualistic male selves via mobility and a fluidity of boundaries, Jack Kerouac creates an alternative version of identity, one which is devoid of architectural influence can therefore perhaps be considered to be true, a real version of the self that is not worn so much as it is simply allowed to be. Clearly, as Rebel Without a Cause and Jack Kerouac's On the Road have indicated, there is some considerable significance in the way bounded spaces function as enforcers of identity, and indeed how the negation of such spaces can, in opposition, act as a passage towards freedom. But what of the typecast spaces of frequently shored up emblematic ideas of 50s America? What are the spaces that Jim Stark attempts to rebel against and Sal Paradise tries to escape from? The suburban space is one which actively instilled notions of acceptable masculine, but in particular feminine, identity. Here there exists a greater force on bodies, that of the architecture itself, for it is the home, the built structure of domesticity, that wields the greatest power when prescribing gender identities through the ideological ethos of containment. This sense of a regulated and disciplined space is evident in Richard Yates's revolutionary road. Through the insistent reiteration of remembering one's identity and the parallelism of jobs against homes. Intelligent thinking people could take things like this in their stride, just as they took the larger absurdities of deadly dull jobs in the city and deadly dull homes in the suburbs. Economic circumstance might force you to live in this environment, but the important thing was to keep from being contaminated. The important thing always was to remember who you were. In Revolutionary Road, April Wheeler's desperate attempt to escape the conformity of suburban ideals is voiced in her plea. It's your very essence that's being stifled here. It's what you are that's being denied and denied and denied in this kind of life. April, having given up her aspirations as an actress, functions as a protagonist whose individuality and desires are muted by the role she has to adopt in order to fit her spatial location. Be good consumers and have a lot of togetherness and bring our children up in a bath of sentimentality. Daddy's a great man because he makes a living. Mummy's a great woman because she's stuck by daddy all these years. Indeed, the very layout of suburban spaces meant family space and family togetherness functioned as a form of containment, where private spaces, the home, served only one purpose, to protect from outside, the public space, and therefore segregate any outside influence, in effect, containing its inhabitants. Revolutionary Road accepts these notions of containment, but does not excuse them, and the highly ambiguous and ironic title frames the gradual fall from family ideals, undermining the post-war containment enforced by the space inhabited. As the closing lines of the text suggest, the estate agent Mrs Giving's discovery of the dead plants in the cellar, do you know what I came across in the cellar, all dead and dried out? I came across an enormous box of plantlings. Creates a mirror between the emptiness of the architecture and the hollowness of the wheeler's gender. And this highlights the ultimate failure of adhering to domestic gender roles. Perhaps the most powerful image of April's containment is the picture window, a highly complex architectural device in Revolutionary Road, which creates both a barrier between inside and outside and a transparency between interior and exterior. In effect, Picture windows serve no child-centric or gender-designed function, but instead create a troubling fluidity and mobility of surveillance. From the beginning of the text, the picture window dominates the space of the Wheeler's home, being both outsized and staring like a big black mirror, underpinning its centrality to the architecture of the home and its use as a device for surveillance. If the picture window is an object of surveillance, it's mentioned here as a mirror already creates a paradox. The window informs the self of the outside world, informs the outside world of interior subjectivity, and also reflects subjectivity back onto the self in a fluid cycle of reflections. For instance, after his affair with Maureen, Frank returns to the house to find the curtains were drawn in the picture window, 
thereby cutting him off from surveying the family unit within the home and distancing himself from family togetherness, but also offering him a reflection of his own subjectivity, a blankness, a constant site of tension for his character. During an early incident in the home, he is depicted as wanting to pick up a chair and throw it against the picture window. And following April's death, he is seen reading her letter in front of the window. This clearly sets up a, a site of tension between object and subject, where Frank's subjectivity is destabilized by the reflected self seen in the window, reminding him of his ineffectuality and failure to transgress the boundaries of suburban conformity. April's death too is a failed attempt at transgression, seeking to escape her imprisonment by suburban, uh, in suburban status quo through self-aborting their third child. Her subsequent death demonstrates the inability for those incarcerated by suburban moors to alter the intended as dictated by their surroundings. Furthermore, the picture window serves as a reminder of this suburban homogeneity, a staple of the suburban architectural design of the period, and his desire to break it but never committing the act further illustrates his inability to realise an authentic identity. The frames of the home influence the way in which conformist ideas of masculine and feminine selves are performed, and Yeats's text further enforces this ideal. April spends a day doing a kind of work she always hated and lately allowed herself to neglect, cleaning parts of the home that didn't show, suggesting the necessity of conforming to domesticated ideals of womanhood. Yet the inclusion of the word neglecting implies April's inability to conform, as already noted in her character and her occasionally masculine attire. This suggests either her constant attempt to escape suburban gender roles or her failure to adhere to the role expected of her. Either way, the protagonists of Yeats's text continue to attempt to respond to their spatial setting, cleaning parts of the house which are unseen, creating a stone pathway leading away from the back door, and working in a routine job in order to perform as the patriarchal suburban husband. I use the word perform in a deliberate attempt to highlight the performative nature of not only suburban gender prescription as a whole, but also the characterizations of the wheelers. As John Givings proclaims in the text, a feminine woman never laughs out loud and always shaves her armpits. I get the feeling you're male. There aren't too many males around either. Implicit within these lines is the performative nature of masculine and feminine identities within Revolutionary Road, as illustrated by the conventional expectations of what it means to be a feminine woman or a real man. In Yeats's novel, the wheelers are ultimately ineffectual, but must be seen to respond to their location. Therefore, their performance of gender is worn so extensively on the outside, so as to be visible as a constant reminder of their entrapment within a bounded spatial environment. However, towards the end of the novel, April proclaims, I don't know who I am, which complicates this theory. If performative gender is a response to the spatial environment, and to be inauthentic is to allow the body to perform according to the influence of suburban architecture, then a complete loss of self, a creation of a non-self, is in effect a break into authenticity. Hence, despite lamenting her loss of identity through a suburban rooting of the body, April is breaking boundaries of subjectivity, losing a sense of self within the codes of suburban identity. Her absence of self suggests the possibility of a flight out of bounded subjectivity. Unlike the wheelers, whose ineffectuality in resisting the contamination of their space is their downfall, the Raths in Wilson's The Man in the Grey Flannel Suit continuously fight against their suburban location, refusing to conform to the identities bound to their private space. From the outset of the novel, the family dislike their home. By the time they had lived seven years in the little house on Green Tree Avenue in Westport, Connecticut, they both detested it. There is a sense of hostility directed specifically towards their own home being too small and ugly. Whilst in Yeats's text the Wheelers experience an utter sense of disappointment in their home, they still attempt to fit themselves to its walls. Here the Raths not only loathe the Westport home, they also cannot fit its frames. For, as suggested earlier, the home not only reveals itself through a marking on a body within it, but the bodies contained within the space mark the architecture. 
the Rath's dysfunctional and unhappy lives have resulted in a house in which they are no longer proud of, a house that reveals too much of them by way of discrediting their conformity. The house had a kind of evil genius for displaying proof of their weaknesses and wiping out all traces of their strengths. The interior of the house was even more vengeful. In the living room there was a big dent in the plaster near the floor with a huge crack curving up from it in the shape of a question mark. The house clearly takes on its own identity being an evil genius and having the ability to thwart the Rath's good intentions. The personification of the home continues to undermine the familial aesthetic being vengeful in its display of the reality of family life. Perhaps what is most interesting to note here is the question mark curved into the wall as it cracks, a result of an argument over Betsy's spending and Tom's consequential aggression. The crack comes to symbolise a questioning of their place within the home. There is a sense of the home examining their subjectivity within its walls, constantly asking them, where are you? For their lack of conformity ultimately undermines their position within the domestic setting of suburban living. The crack is a perpetual reminder of Betsy's moment of extravagance, Tom's moment of violence, and their inability either to fix walls properly or to pay to have them fixed. Furthermore, the Rath's inability to fix the crack reveals Betsy to be an imperfect housewife and Tom a failed DIY man. Yet the crack is not the only indicator of their failure to fit their surroundings. An ink stain commemorates the only time Betsy ever lost her temper with Janie and struck her, and the lolonium was beginning to wrinkle and was one of a thousand petty shabbinesses bearing witness to the negligence of the rats. Whilst Tom and Betsy cannot conform to the identities determined by their location, their continued attempt to appear to be like their neighbours is undermined by the mirroring of the domestic failure worn on their home. Much like the Wheelers, the Raths seek to escape the suburban landscape, feeling trapped by the walls and furniture in the home. They both began to think of the house as a trap, and they no more enjoyed refurbishing it than a prisoner would delight in shining up the bars of his cell. What is interesting is how both texts align the suburb to a prison with its own personal attributes, and in both cases the city does not figure in the same way. Instead, it is the suburb, and only the suburb, which becomes a contaminating influence and a prison cell, suggesting an area and built environment which diminishes individual autonomy and ultimately poisons the body. However, the Rath's awareness of their inability to conform, powerfully conveyed through the question mark embedded in the wall of the living room, illustrates how disillusionment with the good life automatically victimises the family, and it is arguably this level of awareness that allows Wilson's protagonists to move beyond the gender roles dictated by suburban space. <coughs> it is, however, the depressing sense of impending repetition and the continuation of the cycle of suburban discontent which undermines their potential enlightenment. Upon learning of Tom's infidelity in his son in Italy, Betsy's behaviour is unrealistically forgiving. Her desire to support Tom's son seems indicative of her position as a married woman of a certain social standing in a suburban environment, and her casual forgiveness of his misdemeanours are a symptom of her desire to belong. Betsy conforms in terms of appearance, and rather than separate publicly, her loyalty to maintaining a public identity comes at the price of real marital experience. Furthermore, with the creation of a new suburban living development at the end of the text and its promotion of fresh suburban mobility, Betsy and Tom engage in the selling of an unobtainable dream at which they have failed. Much like Tom's PR job, they sell an image of life which is false, and given their discontent and loathing for their own home environment, it seems unlikely that a new enterprise will be able to produce a more favourable version. This cycle of suburban dissatisfaction is perpetuated as the opening chapter mirrors the final pages. The crack and ink stains cannot possibly put an end to their personal road, as Betsy's desire, but also ultimate failure to be thankful and grateful for her life, continues into the closing pages. We're not going to worry anymore. No matter what happens, we've got a lot to be grateful for. City spaces, on the other hand, function in an altogether different manner. 
Hubert Selby Jr.'s last exit to Brooklyn depicts the cruelness and brutality of the contemporary urban environment, where the raw and very emotive style of narrative graphically depicts life in Brooklyn during the Cold War. Characters are repeatedly victimised through the violence of the environment within, with, within which they are trapped, posited by, by the familiarity of the brownstone neighbourhood and housing projects. Enveloped in a microcosm defined by white-collar workers, factories, breadlines, prostitution and youth rebellion, the protagonists of the text seek refuge in the visibility of their failings and inability to find themselves, free from the rot, crime and degradation housing them. Selby's choice of an urban location, albeit one adjacent to a large city, thereby automatically marginalising peoples and events from New York, whilst also being influenced by the neighbouring cityscape, conflates the issues of concrete selfhood. Bodily forms, rather than labelled as individuals, are categorised through a glimpsed judgement – black, white, short, fat, thin, male, female – the metropolitan space actively fosters the active viewing of bodies, repeatedly putting them on display without consideration of their subjective identity, and thereby enabling the possibility of fluid and changeable identity to emerge through the unknowable nature of the self they have encountered. Last Exit acknowledges this ambiguity of city identities, and the text refers to several Harrys, Marys and Mikes, all as unidentifiably similar and different from the last. One such character who attempts to escape the urban frame is Tralala, a 15-year-old Brooklynite who commodifies her seemingly adult body in keeping with the metropolitan flow of capitalist exchange. The crude and demeaning downfall of Tralala is testament to Selby's citified bodies, the here identity, whilst continue to emphasise the exterior, is based on the visibility of sexual availability, posturing the body in a way which accentuates her femininity. Her body becomes artifice and a product to be bought and sold by way of its surface, reflecting her urban surroundings with equal disregard for interior or selfhood. Tralala is granted a position as sexual object rather than individual, solely because of her appearance her ability to pass as a woman and not a girl, and whilst Tralala is happy to get something out of it, she seems unable to realise the part she plays in the purchase of goods, the selling of her mature body for a chance to go to the movies, buy cigarettes or eat a pizza. Selby's depiction of femininity is one of raw and base qualities, a brutal and crass undercutting of selfhood in favour of the promotion of visibility as akin to truth. And it is precisely because Tralala inhabits the brutal Brooklyn streets that she suffers objectification, becoming nothing more than another surface for cultural saturation and promotion. Much like the city streets she inhabits, she too is capable of indifference, displaying spiteful violence when her clandestine intentions are exposed, and a rapid switch repeatedly from whoring to beating highlights her performative identity, suggesting the unsuccessful adhesion of either mask, her visibility and lack of subjectivity, as well as her spiteful childishness, kicking and screaming when she's denied her prize. Tralala defines a transgressive version of the self through visible actions, which denies and resists hegemonic female domesticity, and instead she is as commodified as the urban location in which she resides selling her body for goods and mirroring the savagery of the mean Brooklyn streets. When she meets an officer in uptown New York, Tralala momentarily shifts from, adult, from child to adult, but her dismissal of his departing letter's possibilities diverts her route back to marginality, and she returns to the transgressional space of Brooklyn at the end of her chapter. Selby's narrative style enforces the gathering momentum of her final scene breaking down grammar and punctuation, and producing sentences and paragraphs which flow into one another in one long descriptive sentence. Tralala, we fear, is on a path towards destruction and chaos. Determined to be deemed sexually appealing, she desperately objectifies herself only to have her advances rebuffed, ultimately threatening her identity and destabilizing her power and hence her desperation increases as she seeks sexual advancement to validate her identity. 
She was dragged down the, st down the steps, tripping over someone's feet and scraping her ankles on the stone steps and yelling, but the mob, not slowing their pace, dragged her by her arm to a wrecked car in the lot at the corner of 57th Street and yanked her clothes off and pushed her inside and a few guys fought to see who would be first. In the final pages of Tralala's chapter, she is repeatedly gang-raped in a parking lot, overseen by children, drunks and seamen, whose enjoyment of her as entertainment, passing round beers and taking turns, and their disregard for her results in the brutal shattering of her body, literally and figuratively breaking her commodified beauty and bodily subjectivity. Even when Tralala loses consciousness, the mauling of her body continues when the children tear her clothes to small scraps, put out cigarettes on her nipples and pissed on her. The unsettling scene shatters Tralala's body, and in doing so shatters any refuge of selfhood, for her visible identity has now been destroyed, scarred and marked by the volatility and brutality of the Brooklyn streets, rapidly passing her over from childhood to death, dying as she lived a wasted and embittered receptacle of the material and the savage. Selby's vision is hostile in nature, and the world of Brooklyn irrevocably holds and perverts the people who it produces. In a text where no real individuals can be found, and only brutalised shadows of humanity emerge from the nightmare of Selby's urban landscape, it is not surprising to find his novel, and indeed Tralala's demise, reflects a quest for subjectivity and authenticity where the violent ends can be interpreted as a fight and a struggle for individual recognition, and true selfhood devoid of the crudeness and hatred enveloping characters' bodies. Holigo Lightly, on the other hand, models herself on an altogether different type of visible urban body, but one which is still confined to surface promotion. In Capote's Breakfast at Tiffany's, her character is constantly travelling, shifting her presentation of a coherent subjectivity between the spaces of pastoral America, as Lula Mae Barnes, to the self-fashioned ideal of Holly, the New York socialite. This refusal to be named, and therefore provided with a permanent identity, actively enforces her desire for a fluid subjectivity, allowing her to remake, remould and re-territorialise her bodily representation of a single female in the city. Her persistent idealisation of Tiffany's, likening it to being rich and famous, but still being a place where she can be me when I wake up one fine morning and have breakfast at Tiffany's, highlights Holly's fantastical persona, avoiding a stable subjectivity through unobtainable ideals, and thereby firmly asserting the importance of appearance rather than substance as equal to authentic identity. The employment of Tiffany's also works to create a distinctively New York character, linking her to New York sites and a shaping of the body which relies upon fine things, entertainment and capitalist markings in order to root it within the city space. Holly's apartment, for instance, is described as though it were just being moved into, where suitcases and unpacked crates were the only furniture and her bedroom had a camping out atmosphere, evidently pointing to her shifting character one which is refused permanence by denying herself a home. Instead, Tiffany's emerges from the text in an ironic fashion. As a symbol for home and a sense of belonging she can never acquire. I don't want to own anything until I've found the place where me and things belong together. I'm not quite sure where that is just yet, but I know what it's like. It's like Tiffany's. Holly's inability to find stability is the result of her adoption of a citified body and her literal embodiment of the New York culture in which she lives directly informs her quest for <coughs> ideals through consumer and capitalist tastes. Holly is herself a product of New York. I love New York, even though it isn't mine, but it belongs to me because I belong to it. So much of her assumed persona is informed by New York that she fashions a body in keeping with the cultural signifiers surrounding her. Her body is rigorously created through the use of objects and props in order to create the effect of a coherent identity as Holly, emerging from such wreckage with the eventual effect pampered calmly and immaculate. Her use of a pair of dark sunglasses and a slim cool black dress, black sandals and a pearl choker create the illusion of the Manhattan socialite she aims to embody. Her body becomes a deliberate artifice, uh, artifice with a distinction and recognisable identity. 
fashioning herself into an artificial object of her own creation, much like the branding of Tiffany's as exclusive, precious, and with emphasis on aesthetic value. Holly's embodiment of New York's culture is reflected in her reliance upon commodities, such as her props, the dark sunglasses, the pearls and the makeup, as well as the text's constant employment of blurred boundaries between real and artificial, and the projection of capitalist aspiration and worship. And whilst Holly is an ideal consumer, desiring objects in order to maintain her performance, she herself is bought and sold as consumer product, as the carving of the girl's head in Africa and her questionable relationships with gentlemen callers. He's an opportunity, believe me. In the same way the New York skyline is distinctive for its appearance, its visibility as capitalist, consumer-driven and objectified urbanity, so too is Holly Go Lightly, observed as cityfied, objectified and identified through a presentation of a discernible image. If there exists an essential and implicit relationship between bodies and spaces, then it must be possible for bodies to inscribe architecture, where city and suburban structures actively reflect the bodies within and around them. As we have already explored, the fluidity of bodies translates in the built environment into a plasticity of space, where the mutual flow of inscription creates bodies with effects, and therefore this relationship between structure and subjectivity is one of intrication, specification, interpolation and inscription that produce identities for both spaces in their particularity and population. Bodies are the unspoken condition of architecture, and hence where architectural structures are key to the definition of the space and those inhabiting it, the built environment is as much a reflection of corporeal alignments as they are reflections of it. In suburbia, the centrality of the domestic space and the objects therein clearly shapes the performance of bodies, but the density of commodification, the reliance upon surveillance and the incorporation of vision into architecture through picture windows, as well as in these familial settings, made, transgressive, uh, made transgression near impossible for cookbooks, television magazines and homes themselves entrench female bodies into specific modes of performativity. Cities similarly foster relationships between urban bodies and the metropolitan space itself reflecting inscriptive elements onto and into each other. But as the performance of Holly and Tralala demonstrate, cities create a process of flow and exchange, suggesting a greater potential for slippage between conformity and individualism by promoting visibility. If city bodies mirror city culture, there exists the propensity for identity to become more fluid and malleable, a body who can express a multiplicity of shifting selves with every street corner. At a time when politics called for authentic American identity and in the wake of containment culture, it is troublesome to find this identity can be characterised by behaviour, action and visibility over inherent values and beliefs. It is precisely this paradoxical relationship between national identity and authentic identity which conflates the post-war scare of foreign infiltration and solidifies the impossibility for values such as individualism, autonomy and heterogeneity. It is truly ironic to encounter a nation promoting itself as a utopian paradise of freedom and democracy when its citizens seem almost entirely moulded by Cold War spaces designed to homogenise them and their behaviours. If the cities are remembered, uh, sorry, if the 50s are remembered as the epitome of togetherness, wholesomeness, values and Americanness, this paper exposes the fractured and complicated nature of that identity, where bodies are moulded by objects, cultures and politics beyond their control, denying them autonomy, authenticity and truth. Feminist corporeality makes clear the perpetual nature of these inscriptive surfaces and committing bodies in a recurrent process of signification. It was the American landscape itself which actively denied personal privileges and kept bodies with invisible, knowable and categorised boundaries. The result is a national identity based on repeated performance, maintained through fear of penetration and isolated by its reliance upon props of national endeavour and importance. When stripped bare, the culture of the Cold War built a nation of bodies who believed in their collective identity and national heritage, but were, rather, investing in simulacra, 
fabrication and the power of visibility as real, a version of nostalgic Americana still upheld with irrefutable loyalty and allegiance to this day.